Judge Jackson, welcome. Uh, Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. You and I have known each other a long time. We have. Uh, we went to law school together. We were on the law re re review together. We were a year apart. Uh, we Happily were, so, I hope, yeah. Senator. <laughs> uh, we were not particularly close, but we were always friend friendly and cordial. We were. Uh, and you and I had a very positive and productive meeting uh, in my office uh, where we discussed a number of things, including you were there with, with former Senator Doug Jones. Uh, and we discussed how he and I and a number of other senators had for, for two different years participated in reading aloud on the Senate floor uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from a Birmingham jail, which is one of the truly great uh, advocacies for civil rights our nation has seen. And, and you and I talked together uh, about our shared admiration for Dr. King. Uh, when Senator Grassley questioned you earlier, he asked in particular about Dr. King's speech uh, on, on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, where he said most critically, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Do you agree with what Dr. King said in, in that speech there? I do, Senator. Um, as we were discussing it, uh, you referenced in my office a, a speech that you gave in January of 2020 uh, at the University of Michigan School of Law. Uh, and after our discussion, I pulled a copy of your speech and read the speech uh, in its entirety. And there were elements of the speech that I thought were really powerful. Uh, and let me say, your, your opening remarks yesterday were, were powerful and inspirational as well. And I, and I think you and your family, the journey you have taken to becoming a federal judge, to becoming a federal court of appeals judge, I think demonstrates the incredible promise and the incredible opportunity this nation offers all of us. As I read your speech at the University of Michigan Law School, however, uh, there was a portion that surprised me. Uh, and in particular in that speech, you referenced the work of, quote, acclaimed investigative journalist Nicole Hannah-Jones. And her, and again, this is a quote from the speech, provocative thesis that America was born in, uh, that, that, that the, um, provocative thesis that the America that was born in 1776 was not the perfect union that it purported to be. And indeed, Ms. Hannah Jones in her 1619 projects describes the central thesis of the 1619 project, which the New York Times laid out as a revisionist look of history, revising American history. And Ms. Hannah Jones described her th central thesis as, quote, one of the primary reasons the colonists decided to declare independence was because they wanted to protect the institution of slavery. Now that claim is a highly contested historical claim. Um, do you agree with Ms. Hannah Jones that one of the primary reasons the colonists decided to declare independence is because they wanted to protect the institution of slavery? Thank you, Senator. When I gave that speech at the University of Michigan, I was asked to speak on Martin Luther King Day. And um, every year they have a Martin Luther King Day speaker. And I gave a speech about black women in the civil rights movement. Um, most of the speech, if not all of the speech, was focused on African American women, um, their contributions to the civil rights movement unsung contributions in many cases, and then some of the more recent African-American women um, who have made claims, who have uh, done things in our society. Uh, one slide was of Ms. Uh, a journalist, as you say, who, who made that statement, and I called it provocative. Um, it is not something that I've studied. It doesn't come up in my work. I was mentioning it because it was, at least at that time, something that was talked about and, and well known uh, to the students that I was speaking to at the law school. So are you aware that, that since the 1619 Project came out, that it has been roundly uh, refuted by very respected historians, including Gordon Wood of Brown University, including James McPherson, uh, of Princeton University. McPherson called it a, quote, 
very unbalanced, one-sided account which lacks content and perspective. And indeed, it was so thoroughly refuted that the New York Times quietly altered the digital version to remove references to 1619 as the year of America's true founding and the moment America began. W were you aware of that? I was not. So let me ask you, related to the 1619 Project, which I believe is, is deeply inaccurate and misleading, um, 1619 Project is closely, closely intertwined with a movement that is called critical race theory. Uh, critical race theory, as you know, originated at your and my alma mater at, at the Harvard Law School. Uh, in your understanding, what, what does critical race theory mean? What is it? Senator, my understanding is that critical race theory is, um, it is an academic theory that is about the ways in which uh, race interacts with um, various institutions. It doesn't come up in my work as a judge. It's never something that I've uh, studied or relied on, and it wouldn't be something that I would rely on if I was on the Supreme Court. So critical race theory, as you know, has its origins in the critical legal studies movie, movement, which also came from Harvard Law School, from a number of critical legal studies professors, crits as they were known when we were in law school, uh, who are explicitly Marxists. And they find their origins in Marxism, although critical legal studies frames society as a fundamental battle between socioeconomic classes. Critical race theory frames all of society as a fundamental and intractable battle uh, between, between the races. It views every conflict as, as a racial conflict. Um, do you think that's an accurate way of viewing society and the world we live in? S Senator, I don't think so, um, but I've never studied critical race theory and I've never used it. It doesn't come up in the work that I do as a judge. So, so with respect, I, I find that a curious statement uh, because um, you gave a speech in April of 2015 uh, at the University of Chicago in which you described the job you do as a judge. And you said sentencing is just plain interesting because it melds together myriad types of law, criminal law, and of course constitutional law, critical race theory. So you described in a speech to a law school what you were doing as critical race theory. Uh, and so I guess I would ask, what, what did you mean by that when you gave that speech? With respect, Senator, um, the quote that you are mentioning there um, was about sentencing policy. It was not about sentencing. Um, I was talking about the policy uh, determinations of bodies like the Sentencing Commission when they look at a laundry list of various academic subjects as they consider what the policies should be. Okay, but, Critical you, but you race were vice chair of the Sentencing Commission, so let me ask again, what did you mean by, because that was an official responsibility of yours, what, what did I you meant, mean by what you were doing was critical race? What I meant was that there are a number of, that that uh, slide does not show the entire laundry list of different uh, academic disciplines that I said um, relate to sentencing policy, but none of that relates to what I do as a judge. So let me ask you a different question. Is, is critical race theory taught in schools? Is it taught kindergarten through 12th? S Senator, I don't know. I don't think so. I believe it's an academic theory that's at the law school level. OK. Um, as you may recall, during the confirmation hearings of Justice Amy Coney Barrett, there was a great deal of attention paid to the fact that Justice Barrett served as a board member on the Board of Trustees of a religious private school, and, and the press focused very intensely on the views of that school. In your questionnaire to this committee, you disclose that you are similarly on a board, specifically the Board of Trustees for the Georgetown Day School, and that you've been a board member since 2019, and you're currently still a board member. Is, is, is that correct? That is correct. Uh, in regard to the George, Georgetown Day School, you've publicly said Quote, since becoming a member of the GDS community seven years ago, Patrick and I have witnessed the transformative power 
of a rigorous progressive education that is dedicated to fostering critical thinking, interdependence, and social justice. When you refer to social justice and the school's mission on social justice, what, what did you mean by that? Thank you, Senator, for allowing me to address this issue. Georgetown Day School has a special history that I think is um, important to understand when you consider my service on that board. The school was founded in 1945 in Washington, D.C. at a time in which, by law, there was racial segregation in this community. Black students were not allowed in the public schools to go to school with white students. Georgetown Day School is a private school that was created when three white families, Jewish families, got together with three black families and said that despite the fact that the law requires us to separate, despite the fact that the law is set up to make sure that black children are not treated the same as everyone else, we are going to form a private school so that our children can go to school together. The idea of equality, justice, is at the core of the Georgetown Day School mission. And it's a private school such that every parent who joins the community does so willingly with an understanding that they are joining a community that is designed to make sure that every child is valued Every child is treated as having inherent worth, and none are discriminated against because of race. So Judge Jackson, all of us will agree that, that no one should be discriminated against because of race. When you just testified a minute ago that you didn't know if critical race theory was taught in K through 12, I, I will confess I, I find that statement a little hard to reconcile. Uh, with the public record, because if you look at the Georgetown Day School's curriculum, it is filled and overflowing with critical race theory. That, that among the, doc, the books that are either assigned or recommended, uh, they include critical race theory, an introduction. Uh, they include the end of policing and ad, an advocacy for abolishing police. They include How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram Kendi. They include literally stacks and stacks of books, and I'll tell you two of the ones that were most stunning. They include a book called Anti-Racist Baby uh, by Ibram Kendi. And there are portions of this book that, that, that I find really quite remarkable. One portion of the book says babies are taught to be racist or anti-racist, there is no neutrality. Another portion of the book, they recommend to babies confess when being racist. Now, this is a book that is taught at Georgetown Day School to students in pre-K through second grade, so four through seven years old. Um, do, do you agree with this book that is being taught with kids that, that babies are racist? Senator, I do not believe that any child should be made to feel as though they are racist or though they are not valued or though they are less than, that they are victims, that they are oppressors. I don't believe in any of that, but what I will say is that when you asked me whether or not this was taught in schools, critical race theory, my understanding is that critical race theory as an academic theory is taught in law schools. And to the extent that you were asking the question, I understood you to be addressing public schools. Georgetown Day School, just like the religious school that 
Justice Barrett was on the board of is a private school. Okay, so, so you agree critical race theory is taught at Georgetown Day School? I don't know because the board is not, um, the board does not control the curriculum. The board does not focus on that. That's not what we do as board members. So I'm actually not sure. Well, and I'll note that the board is, is chaired by Professor Fairfax, your college roommate who introduced you yesterday. So the two of you serve on the board together. Um, another book that is on the uh, summer reading for third through fifth grade is a book called Stamp for Kids, again by Ibram Kendi. Uh, I read the entirety of the book, and I will say it is uh, an astonishing book. Uh, on page 33, it asks the question, can we send white people back to Europe? That's on 33. That's what's being given to eight and nine years old. It also, on page 115, says the idea that we should pretend not to see racism is connected to the idea that we should pretend not to see color. It's called color blindness. Skipping ahead, here's what's wrong with this. It's ridiculous. Skin color is something we all absolutely see. Skipping ahead, so to pretend not to see color is pretty convenient if you don't actually want to stamp out racism in the first place. Now, what this book argues for is the exact opposite of what Dr. King spoke about on the floor of the, of the Lincoln Memorial. And, and are you comfortable uh, with, with these ideas being taught to children as young as four in, in respect to the first book, as young as eight and nine in respect to the second book? Senator, I have not reviewed any of those books, any of those ideas. They don't come up in my work as a judge, which I'm respectfully here to address. In my work as a judge, which is evidenced from my near decade on the bench. Okay, good. I am then, then let's go back to, to your work as a judge. Um, as was noted in the first slide, you discuss sentencing as being related to critical race theory. And earlier there's been some back and forth as Democratic senators have tried to address your sentencing patterns as it concerns child pornography. And I'll confess, Judge Jackson, as, as look, as I listen to your testimony, I believe you are someone who is compassionate. I believe you care for children, obviously your children and other children. But I also see a record of activism and advocacy as it concerns sexual predators that stems back decades and that is concerning. Uh, you wrote your note on the Harvard Law Review on sex crimes. Uh, the, your note is your major academic work on the Law Review and, and yours is entitled Prevention Versus Punishment Towards a Principled Distinction in the Restraint of relate, uh, Release Six Sex Offenders. And in it, you argue, and I quote, a recent spate of legislation purports to regulate released sex offenders by requiring them to register with local law enforcement officials, notify community members of their presence, undergo DNA testing, and submit to civil commitment for an indefinite term. Although many courts and commentators herald these laws as va valid regulatory measures, others reject them as punitive enactments that violate the rights of individuals who have already been sanctioned for their crimes. Under existing doctrine, the constitutionality of sex offender statutes depends upon their characterization as essentially preventative rather than punitive. And what you go, out, go on to explain is if they're viewed as punitive, they are unconstitutional. If they're viewed as preventative, they are not. And throughout the course of your note, you argue they should be viewed as punitive and therefore unconstitutional. Indeed, in the second to last page, you go through each of those four categories. You say requirements that sex offenders register may or may not be unconstitutional depending upon whether, quote, sex of, in which sex offenders have no privacy right in registration information or blood samples. So you suggest that may or may not be constitutional, although you, you raise doubts about it. And then you raise very significant doubts about community notification, and you heavily suggest that civil commitment for sexual predators is unconstitutional. D do you still agree with the sentiments you expressed in, in your law school note? Respectfully, Senator, those are not the sentiments that I expressed in my law school note. My law school note was about 
sex offender registration laws, which at the time were relatively new. As uh, you know from our time in law school, one of the things that law school students do is they look for new developments in the law and they try to analyze them. That's something that makes for good fodder for a law school note. My note, uh, which came out in 1996, was shortly after there were new Megan's laws. And the point that I was making was not that the laws were bad, that the laws were wrong. I was trying to assess uh, something that is uh, sort of fundamental in terms of the characterization of the laws. I didn't say that they were unconstitutional one way or the other. What I was trying to assess was how they are characterized. Some, um, some courts would look at those laws and call them preventative, and that has a certain set of uh, uh, consequences. Some courts would call them punitive, and that has a certain set of consequences. And what I was trying to do is figure out how to make the determination, whether they were punitive or preventative. Well, your note argued that they were punitive. And I would note that that view, uh, there have been some on the bench that have advocated that. Uh, the Supreme Court in 1997 decided a case called Kansas versus Hendricks in which it upheld Kansas's civil commitment statute. That was a 5-4 vote. This has been a question that has been close at the Supreme Court. And I would note beyond that, that in terms of the prevalence of these statutes, all 50 states in DC have registry requirements. 47 states have community notification requirements. All 50 states have DNA or blood banks for sex offenders requirements. And 20 of the states, the federal government in DC, have laws that allow for the indefinite detention of sex offenders. I would note in the state of Texas, a state, state court of appeals relying on very much the, the, the same sort of reasoning you advocated in your note, struck down Texas's sexually violent predator civil commitment law. At the time I was the Solicitor General of Texas, I personally argued that appeal in the Texas Supreme Court. And the Texas Supreme Court unanimously reversed the court of appeals and upheld our statute. And, and if the views you advocated in law school prevailed, Civil commitment laws across the country would be struck down, releasing sexual predators. And under the argument, community notification and DNA ba bank laws could well be struck down as well. Is that, is that an outcome that, that, that should concern people? Senator, my note wasn't advocating for the striking down of those laws. My note was trying to identify criteria that I thought could be applied consistently to determine whether the laws were punitive or preventative. But with respect Either to that, character Jackson, you argued that they were punitive, and you further say in the note, if they're punitive, they're unconstitutional. I was looking at four different kinds of laws, and not all of them, did I say, were punitive. OK, so let's take civil commitments laws. Uh, if you look at civil commitment laws right now, the U UCLA School of Law, Williams Institute, estimates more than 6,300 sex offenders are currently detained in civil commitment programs. If the view you advocated prevailed, presumably those 6,300 sex offenders would be released to the public. I is that an outcome that should be concerning? Senator, in law school, when I was writing a note, I was looking at a brand new set of laws that had not previously been enacted in any jurisdiction, they were new. And I was assessing at the time, as law school students do, what criteria I thought might be used by courts to make a determination in the future as to whether or not they should be treated as punitive and therefore not mm -hmm. unconstitutional, but as therefore um, ones that come, carry with them certain rights versus, uh, excuse me, preventative. Those, okay, those Judge, Judge Jackson, so, so you've, you've pointed that these were views in law school. And listen, I will recognize that all of us, when we are students, may have views that, that as time and maturity passes on, we may change. But what troubles me is this was not just a law school view. It's one that has continued. So when you were vice chairman of the Sentencing Commission, you expressed significant concerns 
um, that the White House has argued that your quotes were taken out of context. So I want to provide the full context of your quote, because you said, yes, I want to ask you about the means by which we can distinguish more or less serious offenders. I know that all of you have sort of touched on that. Mr. Fattrell, you talked about going from singular to one-on-one -on -one to group experience. I'm just wondering if there's some sort of inevitable and natural progression from one stage to the other, such that you could say that the least serious offenders are in the singular experience stage. And I guess my thought is, in looking at some of the testimony that other people will have later in the day, I was surprised at some of the testimony with respect to the motivation of offenders, and we're talking about child pornography offenders, and that there are people who get involved with this kind of activity who may not be pedophiles and who may not be necessarily interested really in the child pornography, but have other motivations with respect to the use of technology and being in the group. And you know, here are lots of reasons perhaps why people might engage in this. And so I'm wondering whether you could say that there is a, that there could be a less serious child pornography offender who is engaging in the type of conduct in the group experience level because their motivation is the challenge or to use the technology. They're very sophisticated technologically, but they aren't necessarily that interested in the child pornography piece of it. Now, now I find that a, a pretty remarkable argument that people in possession of child pornography are not actually interested in the child porn. They're not pedophiles. They're just interested in technology. Is, is that, and I wanted to provide the whole quote because the White House said that portions of this were used out of context. So this is your entire quote. Um, do, do you agree with that sentiment that there is some meaningful population of people who have child pornography but, but are not, in fact, um, pedophiles or, or getting, getting satisfaction from it? Thank you, Senator, for allowing me to address um, what appears to be a question that I was asking in the context of a hearing on child pornography. You've provided the entire quote, and it looks as though I was asking that of someone, not taking that position. And the position that I've taken in all of my sentencings involving child pornography offenders is to ensure that despite the attitude and um, view of many of the offenders who came before me when I was a trial judge, that they were just lookers, that they weren't really harming anyone, that they were curating their collections and they never touched a child, I made sure that they understood that notwithstanding their uh, collecting behavior, that they were causing significant harm. So, so Judge Jackson, all right, you, you, you raise your actual sentencing, and I think that's very productive. Let's, let's take a look at your actual sentencing. And you've had 10 different cases involving child pornography. Um, these are the cases. That, there are two, U.S. versus Buttry and U, U.S. versus Can, for which the government did not make a recommendation. And you said earlier, when, when Chairman Durbin was trying to preempt this line of attack, you said it's a sickening and egregious crime, which I very much agree with. Um, and you said the guidelines lead to extreme departures, OK? Uh, let's look at what the prosecutors are asking for. And I would note that this was in the District of Columbia, where prosecutors are far more liberal than many of the prosecutors in this country. And in every case in which, so United States versus Hess, there was a mandatory statutory minimum of 60 months, and you imposed 60 months because you had no discretion. Uh, in United States versus Nickerson, there was a mutual agreement of the parties to 120 months, and that's what you imposed. In every other case, United States versus Chazen, the prosecutor asked for 78 to 97 months. You imposed 28 months. 28 months is a 64% reduction. In United States versus Cooper, the prosecutor asked for 72 months. You imposed 60 months. That was a 17% reduction. In United States versus Downs, the prosecutor asked for 70 months. You imposed 60. That was a 14% reduction. In United States versus Hawkins, the prosecutor asked for 24 months. You imposed three months. That was an 88% reduction. In United States versus Savage, the prosecutor asked for 49 months. You imposed 37. That was a 24% 
reduction. In United States versus Stewart, the prosecutor asked for 97 months. You imposed 57. That was a 41% reduction. Every single case, 100% of them, when prosecutors came before you with child pornography cases, you sentenced the defenders to substantially below, not just the guidelines, which are way higher, but what the prosecutor asked for on average of these cases, 47.2% less. Now, you said you made sure the voice of the children was heard. Do you believe in a case like United States versus Hawkins, where the prosecutor asked for 24 months and you sentenced the offender to only three months? Do, do you believe the voice of the children is heard when 100% of the time you're sentencing child uh, those in possession of child pornography to far below what the prosecutor's asking for? Yes, Senator, I do. Could, could you explain how? I will. A couple of observations. One is that your chart does not include all of the factors that Congress has told judges to consider, including the probation office's recommendation in these cases. Well, Judge Axel, we don't have those probation. The committee has not been given the probation office's recommendation. We would welcome them. I would, Mr. Chairman, I would love to see those. The we second, don't have access to The them. second thing I would say is that I take these cases very seriously as a mother, as someone who, as a judge, has to review the actual evidence in these cases and, based on Congress's requirement, take into account not only the sentencing guidelines, not only the recommendations of the parties, but also things like the stories of the victims. Also things like the nature and circumstances of the offense and the history and characteristics of the defendant. Congress is the body that tells sentencing judges what they are supposed to look at. And Congress has said that a judge is not playing a numbers game. The judge is looking at all of these different factors and making a determination in every case based on a number of different considerations. And in every case, I did my duty to hold the defendants accountable in light of the evidence and the information that was presented to me. In 100% of the cases, was the evidence less than the prosecutors asked for? Senator, the evidence in this, these cases are egregious. The evidence in these cases are among the worst that I have seen, and yet, as Congress directs, judges don't just calculate the guidelines and stop. Judges have to take into account the personal circumstances of the defendant, because that's a requirement of Congress. Judges have to consider things like the victims, and when I was talking about making sure that victims circumstances are heard. It was about my sentencing practices well, that, that I show victims being heard with respect. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.